Hey, faithful listener, welcome to season six of the Bible Explained podcast, the podcast where the Bible gets explained. So grab your cup of coffee and enjoy today's discussion from the book of Acts. Good morning, faithful listeners, and welcome to the Bible Explained podcast. So you may have noticed a couple days ago that I sneakily snuck the introduction back into the beginning of the podcast, and that's because I decided I'm going to keep doing an introduction. I think it flows better when I have one, and hopefully you guys enjoy it as well, as well as the uh, the little jazzy song that I made at the beginning. And yes, I actually did record that, though I used in a drum track online because I cannot play drums. Percussion wise, I am very terrible, but I can play some musical instruments here and there and I like to dabble a little bit. And so I thought up that jazzy little riff at the beginning of this podcast episode. But let's go ahead and read Acts chapter two, verses 22 through 41 today. And this is the part of Peter's sermon that is just absolutely blunt and amazing, in my opinion. I absolutely love it. So grab your Bible in the version that you prefer, but this morning I'm going to be reading out of the NIV version. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said this about him. I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. You gotta wonder, is this the same Peter speaking this sermon that literally abandoned Jesus on his dying night only months before this? And yes, it is. This is literally the power of the Holy Spirit. It says in scripture that God does not give somebody a spirit of fear, but he gives them a spirit of a sound mind and confidence and courage. And you can see this really being played out here as Peter is speaking to literally thousands. We don't even know how many thousands Peter is speaking to here, but we know it's thousands because thousands of people were actually added to the Christian faith this day because of Peter's sermon here. And so, yeah, same guy, but totally different attitude in just a handful of months. So we talked about the first portion of this sermon the other day. And the first thing that Peter addresses is the claim that all the early Christians who were speaking in tongues were actually drunk. 
And Peter says, no, first and foremost, we're not drunk because it's nine in the morning. And secondly, what you're seeing and hearing here is actually an outpouring of the Holy Spirit from the book of Joel. Joel was a prophet from long ago who prophesied that the Holy Spirit was going to be given out to many, many people in the last days. And so Peter reminds all the Israelites of the book of Joel from the Old Testament And he says what the crowd is now seeing and hearing with the believers, the early Christians, you know, speaking in tongues is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So we talked about all that on Tuesday, but now Peter isn't done with with the sermon yet. He addresses the claims about the speaking in tongues, but now he has to talk about why the Holy Spirit has now been given to people. Because before the Holy Spirit primarily lived in the temple. But when Jesus died on the cross and the veil on the temple was like ripped from top to bottom, that it was symbolizing that the spirit was no longer just residing in the temple, but that the spirit would be everywhere. The spirit would now be residing in anybody who came to faith in Jesus. Now, I should mention that not just anybody can get the Holy Spirit. You can't just will the Holy Spirit to come and live in you, basically, you have to accept Jesus. And this is basically what what Peter is about to mention here to the people. He says, anybody who truly accepts Jesus as their personal savior will get the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he starts out by saying in verse 22, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. So he reminds the crowd of Jesus, and this is the meat of Peter's sermon, the gospel message to all these Jewish people that are in Jerusalem right now. He says, look, you guys, do you remember Jesus of Nazareth? Of course you do, because he's alive and we're all witnesses of it. And you guys all saw him and and you guys remember all the miracles he did before he was crucified. And he says, Jesus did all these miracles by God to you guys so that you could see that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. But in spite of all of that, you handed Jesus over to wicked men or to lawless men, the Romans, to have him crucified. And you were totally okay crucifying your Messiah. Notice how blunt this is. This is literally the opposite of what we hear in church today. Like the typical church service nowadays is is you go to church, you, you sing some worship songs that are talking about your feelings towards God <laughs> and how much God loves you and, and cares for you and, you know, whatever. And then you hear an encouraging and affirming sermon. And then you leave not understanding anything about sin not understanding anything about the sacrifice that Jesus paid on the cross. And I'm not saying that every church is like that. I grew up in a church where, in fact, it was the opposite, where all you heard about was how bad you were and how mean God the Father was. And he's going to strike you dead if you don't do this or that. So it, it takes two extremes. I'm not saying that. But the majority of churches, I think, nowadays fall into the affirming and encouraging aspect of things. And we can talk more about the the guilt-ridden side of church in a different episode. But there's not many churches that lean that direction too often anymore. But anyway, you go to church, you, you sing some affirming songs, and then you hear an affirming sermon, and then you leave feeling, I guess, kind of good about the day. You go do your stuff throughout the week, and you go back to church, and the cycle repeats. And you never hear anything about sin. And yet here's Peter. He's like, you guys handed the Messiah over to lawless men, Romans, who did not have the Old Testament law, lawless men so that he could be crucified. You put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Now, some people might think this is a really harsh sermon, especially nowadays, but I think it's more important to tell truth rather than worrying about if somebody is going to be offended by that truth. And that's what Peter was doing here. Now, of course, we do have to speak the truth in love. And I do think Peter was speaking the truth in love here because he was talking to all these people of Jerusalem and sharing the gospel with them. And part of the gospel is that we 
have sin. Each individual person has sin, and that's why we can't get into heaven. And each one of us also contributed to nailing Jesus to the cross, basically, because of our sin nature that Jesus had to pay for. And so Peter was speaking the truth in love. But sometimes love is harsh, and sometimes the truth is harsh. But Peter was not afraid of offending this audience. And clearly, clearly this worked because of the 3,000 people that at the end of this got baptized and became Christians. Well, anyway, Peter goes on to talk about a prophecy from David, King David. And this is a prophecy from Psalm chapter 16, verses 11 through 8. David said this about Jesus. I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life and you will fill me with joy in your presence. Now, this was a prophecy that we actually talked about in the book of John where Jesus's body did not see decay at all. It was in the tomb for three days, but it did not see any decay because before that decay could even happen, Jesus rose from the dead. And so that's basically what Peter tells the the Israelites here. He says, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. So he says, this Psalm is not about David. David was not writing this about himself because David is dead. We have his tomb here in Israel. It's not about David. It is about Jesus. David was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. God raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. So Peter confidently and boldly proclaims Jesus as the Messiah. And what's more, Peter says that he is a witness of seeing Jesus resurrected from the dead, as well as all the other disciples that are with him. And then he says, For David did not ascend to heaven, but he said in this psalm, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So once again, another prophecy from David. And we actually talked about this prophecy as well. Jesus quoted this psalm actually to some Pharisees and uh, when they were getting mad about Jesus declaring himself as God, he quoted Psalm 110 verse one, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. But Peter is using this psalm here to once again say that David was a prophet who was prophesying about Jesus, the Messiah saying that Jesus was the one who ascended up into heaven. David didn't ascend to heaven, and yet he was saying this about the Messiah Jesus. Then Peter ends his sermon by saying, Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God made Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So he concludes with this beautiful statement about Jesus, that God has made Jesus Lord and Messiah. So Jesus is, in fact, our Lord and our Messiah. So when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? So this sermon moved them. It was like stirring their souls. They were distraught over this. They believed Peter's words. They believed the prophecies of the Old Testament and they remembered Jesus and all the miracles that Jesus had done in Israel. And so Peter replies, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So if Jesus were just a man, you know, just a ordinary man that that attained a different level of goodness than you and I have. Why would Peter say to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins? Why wouldn't Peter say be baptized in the name of Yahweh? Because Jesus isn't just a man. He isn't just a good man. He is our Lord. And he's our Savior. He is God. He is part of the Trinity. 
And the Trinity is very, very hard to understand. (laughs) And we're going to talk a lot about the Trinity coming up. And I don't understand everything about the Trinity. I can't possibly understand everything there is to know about the Trinity. But the basic concept is that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all together God. And this is a, a concept that's talked about in Isaiah, the famous Christmas passage that says, He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. That prophecy from Isaiah is talking about Jesus, that he is going to be called Wonderful Counselor. We think of the Counselor as the Holy Spirit. He's also going to be called Mighty God because he is our Mighty God. He's also going to be called Everlasting Father, God the Father, and Prince of Peace, which is what we know of as Jesus. So how, if Jesus was just a man, how could he be called all of those other things? It's because he's part of the Trinity. He is one with God the Father and also with the Holy Spirit. So the people hear about all this and they end up getting baptized. But Peter says, don't just get baptized in the name of Jesus. You must repent of your sins. Repent means to turn away. Now, of course, no matter how much we repent of our sins, we still live in the sin nature and we're all still going to fall short. That's just a fact of life. But now, instead of having no hope of achieving salvation, we have hope and we have grace because of Jesus who was crucified for our sins. So when we sin now, we can say, Jesus, you know, I am sorry for adding another sin onto your shoulders. I am sorry for doing that. Please forgive me. And Jesus will forgive you. So we need to repent, turn away from our sins, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. No other name. The name of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's a promise to us. When we believe in Jesus, when we repent of our sins, we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. This is a promise for us. This is a blessing that we've been given. I mean, think about it. God literally is giving us the Holy Spirit. Anybody who is a true Christian has access to God living inside of them. That is a blessing that we can't even possibly fathom how much of a blessing that really is. Speaking of blessings, I often forget about um, how awesome my sister is and how good of a writer she is until she wrote her recent blog post about blessings, which was amazing, by the way, and you should read it. I'm linking it in the description of the podcast episode. But anyway, it says in verse 40 and 41 to conclude, with many other words, Peter warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Peter was pleading with these people. So this shows that it truly was done in love because he loved his fellow countrymen enough to plead with them to accept Jesus as their savior. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And this is what we should be modeling sermons after, honestly. Is this format, because clearly this worked This worked, making people think about their sin nature, making them understand the gospel, the good news of Jesus and the gift of the and the blessing of the Holy Spirit. So if any of you listening haven't taken that step to believing in Jesus, what's stopping you? What's holding you back from taking that step? And just as Peter pleaded with his countrymen, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. I'm pleading with you to believe in Jesus as your Savior. I recently listened to a uh, Vodi Bakum, I think his name is, and he was talking about how he was a young boy, and he was uh, he was a Buddhist actually, grew up in a, Bo- a Buddhist household and single mother, who was also a Buddhist, and he believed because of his Buddhist religion that he was going to heaven, but he went to college. And his professor sat down with him and asked him, hey, Vodi, do you know if you're going to heaven or not? And Vodi was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm going to go to heaven. Like, I, I don't see any reason why I wouldn't. And his professor was like, well, how how sure are you? Are you 100% sure? 
And Vodi said, I think I'm about 95% sure that I'm going to go to heaven. And his professor said, well, what if I can give you that other 5%? And I was like, wow. Like, <laughs> And Vodi now, he's like a powerhouse for the, the Christian faith. But that professor was pleading with Vodi to become a Christian. So what's holding you back? How sure really are you that you are going to go to heaven after you die? What Peter is preaching here can give you 100% confidence that you will, in fact, go to heaven after you die. Friends and faithful listeners, share this episode with somebody that you think might need to hear it. Share it on your social media platforms as well. And I just love to hear and see all these beautiful reviews that you've been giving the podcast. So thank you so, so much. Now go over to the YouTube channel because I'm going to be coming out with two new episodes. Actually, I'm going to talk about um, complementarianism versus egalitarianism, which is basically uh, what is a woman's role in ministry. And I'm also going to be talking about Bail Through the Ages. You guys might have remembered the episode that I did, I think on Monday, where I talked about Baal being worshipped throughout all the ages. Well, I'm going to expand on that and do a whole video on it. Well, anyway, friends and faithful listeners, I will see you all tomorrow for an episode out of Judges. Until then, happy listening and God bless.